Welcome to The Cherry Picker, the horror movie podcast where we like to kill people. But not really. I'm your host, Zach Cherry, and with me as always is... Eddie of Edward is Truth. And today we're talking about Scream, released December 20th, 1996. And this is our very first episode. Yeah! Yeah. So <laughs> I guess right off the bat, just because we're in like Scream High right now, we had the new movie yes, come we out, and we're not going to talk about the new movie or any of the sequels but i just wanted to like really kick this off with i guess introducing you to everyone because like first of all i don't think anyone really knows you unless you're uh familiar with my patreon so right. why don't you just like open the floor and talk about your first experience with scream and maybe Share a few things about yourself that, that you'd like uh, my audience, which is soon going to be our <laughs> audience, to know about. Right. Absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, hello. My name is Eddie. Hi, Eddie. Hey. And I'm a longtime horror fan and addict. Uh, <laughs> but uh, with Scream, um, uh, uh, exposure, I was alive in the 90s, so I did not, see, well, I did not see it in the theaters. I did get to experience it via uh, VHS. Got to see the director's cut. Uh, or, you know, whatever, <laughs> the extended cut, the uncut version, the unrated version that had, you know, all that just, stuff. Just a, just a quick question. <laughs> where did you, where did you find that? Like, is it because I've heard that there's some VHSs that have that available and I've never seen that. I think it was it must have been a special pay-per-view event or something like that. And um, I got it via my sister who got it via a friend of hers who, I guess, taped it off of this pay-per-view event or whatever and made a copy because, you know, you could like put two VCRs back in the day side by side, hook them up and burn copies for yourself. Okay. She brought it over and um, I remember watching it and I only noticed, I think, two differences uh, in the entire movie and it was just when they were both in the opening sequence too and I've never mm -hmm. seen on Wikipedia anybody mm -hmm. attest to anything beyond that but I know for a fact that um, when Casey sees uh, Steve uh, bleeding out and everything you see his intestines spill onto the concrete right. at his feet literally out of his like and you see area. his hand like <laughs> squeezing because he wasn't his one hand isn't actually tied down uh, so he oh, had to, <laughs> the actor had to like physically like pump this thing right. that had like the guts I mean, spilling out. It, it still is so quick, but literally yeah. like your eye goes to the intestines spilling out onto the concrete. Like that's that's where your eye goes. Yeah, that's where yeah, mine totally. went. I only watched it like two or three times, and then um, and it was gr grainy. You know, it was a copy of a copy. Mm -hmm. But um, I do. And, and then the other thing I remember was um, the walk toward Drew toward Casey. Uh, in her father's footsteps was much slower. Um, actually, and I thought it was slower, but I listened to the uh, Wes Craven and uh, Kevin Williamson commentary for the first movie, and it wasn't uh, that they sped it up. It was that they eliminated frames right. uh, as per the MPAA. So there were a lot more frames, so it looked more like footsteps going toward Casey Becker. And it was a lot, I have to say, it was a lot creepier. Because, I mean, the way they it kind of, you know, do, uh, not even dollies, but just kind of goes toward her, uh, the way it is in the uh, theatrical version that we're all familiar with, right. it's it, it has a very kind of, ah, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to be around you uh, feel. But the to take steps toward her, it had, it filled me with a lot more dread. I was like, oh, no, 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 that's close enough. Yeah. That's close enough. Ah! And then it lingered on her a little bit longer right. before. There is also yeah. uh, some additional footage cut later on uh, in the finale where Billy and Sue are stabbing each other. So I guess it was a little right. more graphic with what it showed of that. But but other than Whatever that, I think those it. are the, the three instances of, of, of what okay. was mostly cut. Anyway, sorry, please continue with your grainy first experience. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I can't remember if it was a rental or what, but I remember watching it alone late at night. It was a mistake because um, it worked. It was scary because um, I think by this point, I, I didn't really know what to expect from Wes Craven because though uh, I loved New Nightmare, which I think was the last movie of his I saw prior to this. Yeah, 94. Um, yeah, um, even though I loved it, I don't remember really being terribly scared of it. So I thought, oh, and it's going to be like a teen thing whatever but i had no spoilers going in so it was just happening to me and uh and i i am such a can i say the the b word yes. <laughs> okay i am such a bitch when it comes to 
uh, the mystery of a movie. I rarely know what like the who done it is or anything like that. So when it finally got revealed, like I was suspecting everybody left and right the whole movie, and I just went ah, and um, I just remember uh, when by the time it was over, I was just kind of like, well, Wes is back, you know, yeah. Wes Craven, he's ha- back, ha- baby. Returned. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, well, bitch. That's um, me. <laughs> my experience uh, was kind of the complete opposite because I saw it with a lot of people and I was very yeah. much spoiled going into it. It was my 12th birthday party and uh, I just had, you know, a bunch of friends over, um, you know, my mom, you know, got a cake and, and, all, and pizza and all that stuff. Uh, like we lived in a building yeah. that had a swimming pool. So it was like, it was, it was just like a, a big event plan. And she was like, well, do you want to like go to the video store and get a movie? Um, just so mm-hmm. you guys can watch. And I'm like, sure. And I didn't know what we were like going to get. So we went to the yeah. video store and I think that like my mom actually picked out the movie. I'd never heard of Scream before. And this was 1997. So it would have been like within the first year uh, that it was released. And yeah. I think like she knew that like I loved things like goosebumps and are you afraid of the dark that was kind of my gateway into oh. into horror um yeah and and i think like at that time like i was probably like transitioning out of it like you know earlier in my childhood like i really loved that sort of stuff because i had seen a few horror movies at that point i think like the the two or th- horror movies i i saw were actually the first one was uh, uh tales of the crypt presents demon knight uh, and uh, okay. what was the other one? Witchboard Two. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not sure what the the secondary title on that was, but though it, I, it, it, it it was enough to like intrigue me. So I think that she knew that I was like leaning towards the horror genre. So she's, I guess, okay. she had heard of it and was okay. like, "Oh, I hear this is really good." Because at that point, like, Scream had had so much like word of mouth, um, right? And I guess she was just a cool mom, I guess. So, like, thanks, mom, right. for being cool. And <laughs> and a bit clueless. Just kind of like, oh, no, this bump's great. You? He'll like this. No, I mean, just in terms of, like, it's got teens in it. Yeah. It's, it's. I'm sure it's, you know, just fodder. <laughs> like, you know, it'll yeah. probably have something spooky like a witch in it. It's like, or something it's like, like, the, like Archie or something. Right, like right. pre-Riverdale. <laughs> but, um, Pre-Riverdale, before Archie was sexy. Yeah, yeah, so anyway, and had abs. So anyway, we <laughs> were like all here at, the, like, at my party and we put on Scream. And of course, like a few mm-hmm. people had already seen it. And then like the first word out of their mouth was like, oh, well, the killers are Billy and Stu. And I mean, at the time, I didn't really <sighs> register that as like being, like ruining the movie. Like it wasn't a spoiler for me just because like, I wasn't anticipating like a who done it. I was just right. like, oh yeah, a horror movie. So I mean, like in retrospect, yeah, that was really sh- like shitty, and I wish that they hadn't done that. But for me, it was like the entire time, I kind yeah. of like I was like I was still like you know going into the with the mentality that like you're not telling me the truth, like that's a lie or whatever. But by the time we got <laughs> to the end, and I'm like, okay, because even there was the misdirection of the the fake out kill for Billy. So I think even mm-hmm. at that point, I'm like, see, I knew you were lying. And they're like, no, just you wait. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, you could have let me, like, ride Yeah, right? That. Oh, you could have redeemed yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, Terrible. But, I mean, it didn't, it didn't, like, change my perception of the movie overall. Because I think, like, coming out of that scream really became, like, just a door to all of these other movies. Uh. Because, like, from there... You, like, that was my first introduction to Halloween as well, when you have the characters at the party watching it on the screen. And I always remember that, the, the, the creepy, like, Laurie Strode theme that plays as she's walking across the street, which is, like, the, the part of the movie that uh, they're watching when Randy picks up the phone. He's like, hello? Yeah? Yeah. Yes. Um, and it's just, like, that was so haunting. And it just, like, you've got a cat on your shoulder, too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Say hi to everybody. <laughs> you, uh, um, <laughs> She's yeah. going to be here a lot, folks. It Go was, on. <laughs> maybe we'll see her butthole if she turns a little bit, too. Yeah, she probably yeah. will. <laughs> she just wants to be a part of yeah. things. Go we, on. <laughs> yeah. And it was just, it was one of those, like, like pieces of music that was so haunting. I'm like, I need to watch Halloween. And then from there, it was, like, Friday the 13th, mm. Nightmare on Elm Street, oh, like, wow. Evil Dead, all that stuff. So, it, so like, you it, got spoilers for Friday the 13th also. By hearing the phone call. In the I mean, movie. at this point, like, <laughs> that is 
pretty much like the same thing as like Darth Vader being Luke Skywalker's father. Like, oh my God, if you spoilers. Were, if you're born, <laughs> and we've had this conversation off pod before. Yes, like, we If you're born at a certain time, so it's like, I, and this is like for Gen Z kids today. Like, if you didn't know that Billy and Stu were the killers in Scream and you found out about that, like, you don't have anyone to, like, that's nobody's fault other than your parents because they decided yeah, to, like, have you... In yeah. this, at like at this point in time, so it's just like yeah. my mentality always like going into a movie if it's like an old movie that I, you know, hadn't seen but I could have seen like my entire life is just like well yeah. like it's old. There's like information is going to be out there about it. Like I think that like the statute of limitations for spoilers, uh, mm-hmm. I would say at least like a year, and that's really generous because uh, you know in this wow. day and age where things are available like everywhere like you know uh, sure. movies are available for streaming within i think it's like 45 days after its release maybe i'm off on that number but uh it's we're, we're the, the yeah. market is pretty much saturated <laughs> with everything like once it comes out so you know sure. i know that spoilers are really a thing that is annoying especially for this new movie um and it's hard mm. to avoid them and it's like one of those things where you yeah, have to like you have to avoid social media. Fortunately, there's not a lot of totally. movies like Scream that are like predicated on knowing this information. Um, so I don't yeah. I don't think that like spoil like having certain plot elements spoiled is you know you're gonna find that frequently if you're just going online and stuff. But uh, well, plus plus if something is in the zeitgeist <laughs> and it's kind of like you know a mainstream success, immediately people start with the satires and like you know like they'll do satires of it on the Oscars or. or um, you now online, like people on their TikToks are already yeah. probably satirizing the new Scream movie. So, I, but on, yeah. like on that point too, I, I just want to say that I don't think that the reveal of the killers or like the mystery of the Scream movies is the most important thing about them. I wouldn't even say that it's like, mm. you know, high up there because I mean, like you're only going to see a Scream movie for the first time once. And mm. every other time you go and revisit it, you're not you don't have that mindset of just you don't know who the killers are. So really, like, that is a very important aspect the first time you see it. But every time after, like, I don't, you know, like, rate each individual movie primarily on who the killer reveal is or, like, how much of a surprise it is. Because, like, even in the first Scream, that's not really that much of a surprise. Like, those two goofballs are acting, like, super sus- Listen to me talking like a Gen Z. <laughs> Super suspicious the entire thing. So it's yeah. like, you know, by the end, like there there is some misdirection, but it's it's not one of those like I love it for so many other things. Like I could probably list mm-hmm. twenty-five things that I like about Scream yeah. that are above like, oh, and there's a killer reveal and I never like saw it coming. So mm-hmm. I don't know. But I think it also joins the league of a, a bunch of other like spoilery movies where it's like there is a twist, there is a reveal, there is something that you probably should not know going in. But if you know, they're well made enough, like a Sixth Sense or a Psycho or or yeah. a Scream, where you can walk into it kind of knowing. I mean, you did <laughs> basically mm-hmm. knowing like, you know, who the killers are. And then there are things that will make you start to doubt it. I know I've experienced that when I've shown people. I've had a, a handful of people who have never seen Psycho before and I'm like, and you don't know anything about it? They're like, no. It's about a guy, right? And I'm like, oh, we're stri-. and I'll <laughs> Don't tell I'll me it's about a guy. I thought it was about a girl. No, I'll just screen it for them and I'll just like watch, you know, quietly. <laughs> and they'll they'll think they have it figured out. And then there's like a curve, you know, there's like something that happens like yeah. kind of like uh, Billy's death, you know, in Scream. Uh, where they're just kind of like, wait, wait, so I don't know. Maybe oh my God. And I, yeah, those I love are the kind of people that. who <sighs> probably like make really good like YouTube movie reaction videos. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> I mean, I'm not needing to throw any shade, but like those are my least favorite kind of videos. <laughs> I'm just like, it's like first time watching Scream. And it's just like, uh, are you giving, like, like there's no way. <laughs> Every single one of these movies is just like, were, were you like, like born on like an Amish commune or something that like you, you had no access to these movies growing up? I mean, maybe that's the case. I'm sorry. I don't mean to, to, offend anyone who actually does have that exact same situation anyone from the amish community who might yeah. be watching but you know what they're sinning if they are because you know anyway we won't go into it but yeah then sin, uh, on. Also, but, sin on but there's like young 
people yeah. who are like coming up who are like trying to come into their horror i've seen like in comment sections or whatever like people just kind of being like so i don't, i just got into horror what w- what are some gateway things you'd like recommend for me cuz i've only seen uh, you know, uh, I know what you did last summer, or something like that, and it's like, mm-hmm. oh my goodness, darling, you know, like, and, P- and you and I'm, and you scroll on to see what people are commenting, and I'm like, okay, they're taken care of. They got, <laughs> you know, they yeah. they got some slashers in there, they got some werewolves, they've got some aliens, they've got some haunting movies. Okay, we're we're you're on the right track. I don't need to comment today. What? Uh, <laughs> in terms of scream, yeah. like, where is it, where does it not necessarily rank? Um, you don't need it, like a specific number, but like. If you like think about your favorite horror movies, is it in that list? It must be because I know I have you have you have different tastes than yeah. I. Yeah, but we do share some yeah. of this, some similar uh, ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I basically have the first movie memorized. I mean, not as well as you do, but yeah. I, um, I I feel like when I watch it, it's very rare that there's a surprise. But when there is, I'm really, really excited about it because it's, you know, it's like a minuscule thing that makes like a huge difference, like almost like in a ripple effect. Like, oh, I never noticed the way that glance was cast or, you know, something like that. Um, but um, yeah, I'd say, I mean, I own it and I don't own many films. I mean, I don't have, I'm looking at the collection bo- behind you. I mean, I have my own, but... Yeah. It's it's not that vast. It's a few shelves, <laughs> and dwindling down every day. I'm going. Don't need that. I just need. Oh, That's like the basics. opposite of me. I just keep adding to it. And, I know. And I like double and triple dip. Like that's 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 a, a, a thing for another time. Um, I know. <laughs> By the hundredth episode of this, you'll just have like a an entire array. It'll of just Blu-rays be stacks behind, behind me. Yeah. And... <laughs> you'll just be hello. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, but, I mean, say... it's pretty high. I love oh, it. No, sorry, How are you? You, you finished your thought first. <laughs> but I, no, I love it. So yeah. I mean, I I don't really I I I, I don't kind of uh, uh, uh What's the word I'm looking for? No, I, <laughs> um, I do that, but um, no, I, I don't like kind of examine the blood over why something speaks to me and why it's going to stay on the on the shelf. The actually, the thing is, I find myself making a case more so for something to come off the shelf rather than stay on. If something's going to stay on the shelf, it's because oh, I'm not getting rid of that scream, well, and I you know I have the little trilogy blue. So I don't know I'm anyone who would get rid of scream like that's. No, that's a, a I don't frightening know. thought. Um, I think for me, it's definitely. I mean, I never wanted to say that it was my favorite horror movie because you know there are movies that you know I would consider like The Thing or The Shining, that mm. are you know the ones that change your life or just like you you mm. see a hundred times. But I feel like within like the last couple of years of just you know starting my channel and mm-hmm. I scream kind of like choosing me like i like i just started like covering content on like covering these for the upcoming screen movie and that was like the ticket to really you know start to grow my channel so it was just like okay well mm-hmm. i'm gonna keep doing scream and then i kind of like rediscovered them all over again and at this point i'm now just like no like i i pretty sure like i would put scream like if it wasn't my favorite i don't know i'd have mm-hmm. to like really do a deep dive and, and just kind of like <laughs> look inwards to 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 see like what is your favorite horror movie but it's like scream has got to be at least top three at Mm. at this point for me just just because it is so influential and going back to what you were saying before um how like there are so many things that like when you you watch scream over and over again that you notice new things and i think that's just like such a testament to wes craven uh and really everyone involved but like especially wes um because there are so many layers and like textures to this movie that yeah. <clears throat> like all together, well, like when it's all combined, you don't really like pick out certain things here and there. Um, but it's like every single one of those things, like is it's just like a, like a small cog in a, in a bigger thing that makes scream such a like enormous, incredible movie that it is because I mean, like right. even like the, the, videos that I do, like the who killed who and stuff, like really delving into that and just seeing like, okay, well, I never noticed that before of just like, uh, like a certain nuance of how the killer is attacking Mm. Casey. And that's, and you know, I know that this is one of the things that a lot of people challenge me on uh, in terms of my who killed who is that everyone is absolutely certain that Stu is the one that killed 
Casey, or just like the one that brought the knife down on her uh, on the front porch. Um, mm-hmm. Just based on the fact that she takes the mask off and it's like, well, she recognized him. And it's like, well, she could have recognized Billy as well. Like they're, yeah. they went to the same school. Like it's, it's Stu's friend. But the thing for right. me was that just like, he was strangling her. And we see at the yeah. end of the movie that, you know, when, when Billy's on top of Sydney and mm-hmm. he's like, say hello to your mother for me. And like, he starts strangling her the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just like, you know, it's just one of those directions that Wes Craven like would have given the cast just to be like, you know, and I know like in interviews with, with Matthew and Skeet, like people are always asking them like, do you know who killed who? And they always like have the same thing. And it's just like, well, I don't know. We never like had those conversations. And it's like, well, of course yeah. they didn't. Like Wes isn't going to like take the time out to be like, and, and you know, maybe some directors will do that. But I think like with someone like Wes sure. Craven, like he's probably thinking about this movie on so many different levels that he just like... Yeah hopes to or at least like with the cast that he found knows that like they have a trust with one another that they're just going to do the things that he needs them to do and it's all going to make sense in the end so I yeah think, absolutely and that, yeah and that's just really a testament to like the cast as well because i think that with scream it, it was lightning in a bottle with everyone that ended yeah. up in that movie like uh, you, kevin williamson patrick lucier mm-hmm. who edited the, the movie who i never hear anyone talk about him like he never gets enough credit but it's just like those first three screen movies especially um because he didn't edit yeah. the fourth one but it's just like you can really tell like the difference from from like three to four of just like what happened there um because like he, <laughs> he, i mean what happened is that he went off and like started his own career as a director but sure. uh, but just even like as that crew and it's like it, it's almost like shades of, of john carpenter because you know mm-hmm. in his heyday with you know all the movies like the fog and the thing and, and all that like it was the same crew um i don't know if deborah mm-hmm. hill was worked on the thing but it's just like you know dean cundy um mm-hmm. yeah. tommy wallace like all those people like work together and that's kind of like what it felt like with Wes Craven on those first three movies because it was a family. And I know, like, for a fact, like, they did, yes. a lot of those crew did go on and, like, do other movies with him, like Cursed and, like, Red Eye, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I mean, mm-hmm. unfortunately, those didn't turn out the way that they wanted. And, you know, that's the studio's yeah. fault. It has nothing to do with, with Wes or anyone creatively. <laughs> but uh, but he, being the gentleman that he was, I'm sure he would have, like, owned his part yeah. in it. But um, one never, thing that you... <laughs> I was yeah. just gonna say, like, he never, like bad mouths anyway like if you listen to the commentaries on any of the movies he always praises people even when it's like i disagree with what he's saying just like no that person did a shitty job but he'll be like oh did a wonder (laughs) like he's just such a nice like yeah person was a nice person Uh, so every uh so many of the members of the crew that i've seen interviews with through the years who have spoken about him all say the same thing that he had less of a vibe as a director, given, you know, the other directors they had worked with, and he felt more like their favorite English professor, you know, yeah. like English lit. And um, also, because they would have those conversations, like he was always capable of the, that level of conversation, but at the same time, he was all, he, he was a master of juggling the art form with the business side of it too. Like you were talking about, um, that's another thing, I think he's just kind of a master juggler, Wes Craven, uh, the more I'm na- just having this thought while we're sharing these thoughts because one of the things that stood out to me um always with this movie was the attention to detail and the more i watch it the more thing i start picking up on things and going like oh my goodness a parallel there and a parallel there and also your videos have certainly helped uh point out things to me that i well the first conversation (laughs) we ever had like you're you're telling me (laughs) um that like nev campbell is packing sydney is packing um her, you know, for her um, sleepover at Tatum's, yeah. and she's got the very outfit she's going to wear. Yeah, well, we, 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 the, in, in the, the next day, in the scene, scene when she like comes that. down the stairs after like the phone call with Tatum, where, where she's just like, "Okay, oh, yeah. stay over there." Yeah, and you see her come down the stairs, and it's before she opens the closet. And you know that you get that. Ooh. Oh, um, yeah. But you see her like she's <laughs> holding her jeans and her like pink yeah. shirt, which is the the mm-hmm. wardrobe that she wears for the next day, and it was just like. Oh, I never noticed that. Like, it just like things like that. Like, he was always like on top of everything, yeah. just thinking of like what one scene from the next, and even like it, like because she at that point she's wearing the gray sweater, and yes. you see like d- d- the entire day like during school she has the sweater tied around her waist. So it's like I love yeah. that about like this going down to like the most minute details of even the wardrobe. 
Yeah. And I know that like, you know, in terms of like wardrobe and color, like we've talked about this a lot too. And maybe we'll talk about more of that on the, the sequel when we eventually do Scream yeah. 2. But there's just like, just the way that like, the, they play thematically into the character's role in the movie as well. Like it's just things like that. And, you know, maybe that's not entirely Wes Craven. You know, it, it, you don't take credit away from the, the wardrobe department. But, right. you know, still <laughs> as the director of the movie, like, you know, he has the the final call on that so and i think that's right. why like the, the yeah. first scream movie really is the best i mean i know there's people out there who will challenge that and say that there's you know a sequel that is actually better than the original and you know what like sure. that's right. you, you know if if you believe that like the, the fair enough but yeah, the fact like opinion. yeah like <laughs> be that as it may like this the original scream is the only one that really didn't have any tampering from the studio I think the yeah. most the most interference, which really like turned out to be a good thing, was that Bob Weinstein uh, thought that you know there wasn't any death scenes for like a really long stretch of time uh, in the movie, so that's why they added in the oh, the, yes. the principal Hembry death. Hembry, and I, I think it was even his idea to have the like the reflection of Ghostface in the eyeball. So, mm. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. So I mean, like, I don't, you know, yeah, I don't they, ride. Uh, he did mention that. I don't. So not a exactly, not like sure, yeah. totally horrible, but you know, that's a, a huge pr- producerial duty. Actually, is to just get out of the way and trust the people that you hired. If more producers and more studio heads did that, I think we'd have a lot more great movies to talk about. But whatever. Um, but oh, to finish my thought about like the master juggler, because uh, the attention to detail always stood out to me, but. Uh, this most recent uh, watch when I just it was kind of like just had the commentary on just to kind of like keep it in my head um, to hear the amount of times he because, you know, you think, oh, my God, and it's such a smart script like Kevin Williamson and everything and, and Wes Craven directing those actors that way. A huge part of <laughs> some of our greatest memories from the movie have been improvised and sometimes with Wes's, you know, direction to just be like, we don't have like a button for this scene or we, you know, I don't know what to do with it. If you want to say something, you know, once they got what they needed, do another take. And this one for you, just kind of do something that you feel like. And people like Matthew Lillard could really, you know, <laughs> blossom and bloom because Stu's a very different character on the page than he is in the movie through Matthew Lillard's like, you know, interpretation. And, but see that kind of like attention to detail balanced with a kind of freedom I'm, I'm a huge fan of directors who know how to give all the people they're collaborating with, the actors the, and other members of the creative team behind the scenes, when they know to give direction um, and boundaries, but to give freedom within those boundaries. So you can really start to, that's what collaboration is. You know what I mean? Like someone who's in charge and who says yes or no, but ultimately gives a person who's much more talented than you are at this particular field, the freedom to experiment and to feel like they like like something great you know could happen um and i yeah i really i feel like that uh from Wes craven throughout his career and i haven't heard anybody really contradict and that, i think the thing so. with scream um that maybe like a lot of people don't know about is that like Wes craven's career was kind of over at that point mm-hmm. like just like with new nightmare uh like mm-hmm. the, like the early 90s like were not good to him and that was like like new nightmare bombed and like the studio didn't want to take a chance on Wes Craven, like they, it was they were gonna fire him apparently uh, at the mm-hmm. beginning. So he like did the, uh, the they filmed the opening scene with with Casey Becker first because he wanted to just like get that done and show them that he could do it. Yes. So it was almost like with, with him, not so much starting over, but just like really having to prove himself that you know he yeah. was worthy of doing this movie. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's like it's crazy to think that, you know, someone of his caliber as a director would have to do that. Um, yeah. But I think that just because of that, he, you know, and I don't want to say that, like, you know, going into other movies, like, I don't think that he would just everything that I've seen from him, like, he would not be the kind of director who would develop this, like, diva attitude after, like, having this huge breakaway hit no. and going into, like, other movies. Because he, he was always so, like, sweet natured and down to earth that I think that... Mm-hmm you know, going forward, because he did want to, like, allow people to collaborate and, like, do your thing, because, like, he recognized the talent in people. But I think, like, probably with two, three, and four, it it got to a point where there was so much studio interference, where it's just, like, his hands were tied, and he couldn't do anything. But it's just, like, 
and and we'll mention this more when we do get to the the later entries but there was definitely like a sense that i got that like despite you know like how much interference there was like he always Mm -hmm. went above and beyond like you know even if like the script was not good and it was like it just seemed like you know there was nothing to salvage like he went in there and just like gave it like a hundred percent made the movie the best Mm -hmm. possible version of the movie that it could be um and i think that the reason why scream won is so good is just because like he it, it it's like everything just came together. Like he was already like going above and beyond, but nobody was getting in his way. Mm. So it was just like, that's why that movie is so successful and so popular today. And he would be the first person to acknowledge the perfect storm of people with whom he was working on this film with. Like he, he names them like, you know, just like throughout the entire commentary, it's just name after name, after name, after name. Mm -hmm. Um, in in you know like uh, in praise of like you know what they've done like you said but um i but I, it's nice to know that like he knew and, and kevin williamson certainly knew too like wow this is really coming together mm-hmm. like this is really we're really really lucky to be where we are right now and they behaved like that and everybody did i mean i, I just saw an interview uh a recent interview uh via skype with um skeet ulrich and uh, matthew lillard um discussing that time and it's so funny because <laughs> They were both so incredibly grateful to be discussing this thing that they cared so much about and that they invested so much in. Mm -hmm. And they said, but it's so funny because people ask us all of these questions like we just filmed it. And they don't realize, like, it's been it's been over 20 years, yeah. folks. Like, the memory goes, like, not, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, just just in terms of, yeah. like, you and I or anyone listening who's not an actor. I know you are an actor, though. But um, just, like, for <laughs> whatever your career is or your regular day job. So, like, for instance, right. like, I used to be a server for, like, a really long time. And that would be, like, someone coming up to me and just being, like, remember that one shift you, like, worked on that was, like... <laughs> 15 years ago and this happened and I'd be like no I don't like remember that at all (laughs) but if they asked you about a particularly atrocious customer that you had to wait on that was rude to everybody in the place you'd probably be like oh yeah and then have have a a story of those like just like stored in my memory bank and it's not it's just more so like the the ones that are like completely ridiculous that i'm just like i can't even believe that that's a real person but i but with that mentality like i totally understand why they'd be like i don't remember that like at this point it's 25 years ago now and you know like skeet is working all the time so i just like Mm -hmm. you know how do you you know expect him to remember things like Matthew, I'm sure, is yeah. like, I don't know what he's done lately, but um, you did mention this about uh, Matthew Lillard, and I, and I, and I did want to uh, just talk about it a little bit more, is that in mm. the original script, Stu was like a very nothing character, like just very two-dimensional, and yeah. everything, like, because he did all these ad libs and stuff, but even like his personality and just like the nuances that he brings to the character, he's like the most, I mean, other than like anyone in the like legacy like big three is like the the mm-hmm. one character that everyone is obsessed with and people think that like Stu is the best killer out of everyone i disagree personally i don't think mm-hmm. that that makes him not a good killer but it's mm-hmm. just in terms of the character he's definitely like really high up there because i don't even think that like scream would be the same thing if it wasn't for matthew being Stu in that way because i mean mm-hmm. it could have been yeah. it, you know i mean just in terms of, of who we found out was the stab cast um, from the new movie was Vince Vaughn, uh, who played Stu. So, you know, imagine imagine Vince Vaughn playing Stu. Which, I mean, oh I'm sure God. that would have, like, had its own little um, eccentricities like, as well. But um, Post swingers. Like, that's yeah. insane. But anyway, go on. <laughs> Post Psycho reboot, my God! Uh, no, this no. Like the he was in his thirties. Nineteen ninety eight. Oh, okay. So it would have been so. Pre- stab was made in ninety seven. Uh, when was Stab made? I I don't know because it no Stab was ninety eight. Um, okay, so around the time. It, you but, I mean, Bates, yeah, it would have come out at the same time. <laughs> I always forget, that like, because Scream 2 takes place two years after Scream 1. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you're right. So him and Luke Wilson? <laughs> that would have been Luke interesting. And Tori, yeah. <laughs> um, 
We're getting ahead of this movie, though. But yeah, you were saying. We, we are. Sorry. Was I saying? I don't remember. <laughs> we should just move on to the next thought. All I was, all I was saying okay. was that uh, Matthew Lillard's know, performance, he did his good. irreplaceability. He did good. Yeah, he he did good, and everybody did. I can't imagine. Uh, every uh, again, like through the years, like more and more comes out about like how much input and where the input went for these uh, young actors playing these characters, predominantly, you know, like the core group, and um, it it makes it. So, like, okay, these choices were made, and that's ultimately what ended up on screen. Had those choices not been made, or had, you know, different choices been made yeah. by another actor, it would have been a, it would have been a completely different I mean, but, but even, like, going to the casting, because Drew Barrymore yes. was going to, yeah. like, she was asked to play Sidney Prescott, and it wasn't until she yeah. read the script and just, like, no, I think I identify with this character more. Mm. And it's, like... Obviously, like, Sydney now has grown to be, like, this huge, larger-than-life character, final girl. But just mm-hmm. imagine that if it hadn't been Drew Barrymore playing Casey, I don't know how that scene would have resonated the same. Because, I like, so much right. of, like, why that scene is successful, not just for, like, kind of the twist of, you know, the, the big face on the poster being yes. the first to get killed off... Is just like mm-hmm. I don't know if like another actor could have sold it that way because 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 like it, it comes down to not only her performance which is mm-hmm. like w- probably like one of the best performances of the movie uh, yeah. that only lasts for the first 10, 13 minutes but also sure. just the, the the fact that you know it is this big name and like that was like kind of just like the showing that like anything could happen in these movies. Absolutely. And and it worked. It totally worked. I mean, it worked on me. I was like, oh, we're getting the leading lady in the first shot. Okay. Mm-hmm. We're off and running. And then the scene starts happening and I'm like, what is going on? And, and then mm-hmm. when, by the end of the scene, I'm like, she's going to get away though. That She's going to get saved. I like, mean, it almost I mean, she's looks literally, like it. <laughs> it. She almost does. Yeah. But, and even as he's, but even as she's being dragged away, I mean, number one, I'm really, I still, that's another thing about this movie it, it, that, 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 I I love the fact that like on repeat viewings, that opening scene hooks me right into the emotionality of it all because I'm not sitting here going, going whoa or anything like that about this kill. I am so scared for her. I am so sad for her. There is a tragedy to it because she's trying to scream for her mother. And I I remember everybody at the time in the '90s was like, she should have thrown the phone. And I'm like, she wasn't thinking. <laughs> she was, you know, you're in nightmare like mode and everything like that. Stop criticizing her. But I think it was also in addition to her star power, in addition to the performance which is great and stood the test of time thus far and I think will continue you know for for all the film history um there's also just kind of like what I think Drew Barrymore's screen presence uh like uh, at large you know like in the greater picture of things like she is a naturally sympathetic person mm-hmm. like I I've never seen Drew Barrymore in I've seen her in movies I don't like I've never not liked her I've always been, even even if like she's struggling with say an accent or you know she wasn't given the proper direction, yeah. um, I'll still just see her heart, you know, just like uh, on screen. She always she always offers up uh, her own brand of emotionality yeah. that she certainly lent to this movie. So no matter what my criticisms are for her picking up the phone and talking to a stranger while she's alone in the house at night, you know, or, you know, not throwing the phone or, you know, what have you, any number of things that she could have done differently that she didn't. Yeah. Um, I, I don't walk out of that scene blaming her for them. The most, the strongest thing no. is just the impact of the loss of life, which is also uncharacteristic of many films in the slasher genre. So that's another thing I mean, that I think. I, and I was going to say, like, not only just the, the genre, but even of this franchise, because I'm just trying to think outside of the original. <laughs> and I don't want this to sound like, I know that this sounds like I'm very, like, anti sequel, <laughs> which I'm not. I love all of the screen movies. But, I, but just in terms of, like, outside of this movie, there isn't that emotionality with any of the deaths, really. Like, I'm trying to think. But I mean, like other, like besides, um, you know, especially Casey, but you know, even Tatum, mm-hmm. and to oh. and to to some point, like Kenny as well. Um, but I just like going into Scream Two. It's just it's almost like it's more of just like more blood, more. Like I can just see like <laughs> Mustafa Cad. <laughs> well, I think because also once you start making sequels and yeah. once something, I mean, it had already kind of like 
headlined this new era. I mean, everybody has talked about it, but we can mention it. It had headlined this and and, and kind of initiated this ripple effect of copycat movies that are like okay all we need is like a young teen cast and we'll just have them standing in a row (laughs) or have them flank the star or whatever and uh we'll have like a mystery killer and you know and then we'll just have them all like run around and everything like that and sometimes it worked better than others but i I don't think anything ever really equaled scream but in the sequels the the challenge is to bring a similar feel but also to refresh it and make it Something like one of the things, and I, I won't delve into it, but one of the things that I'm very grateful for in the first sequel is the acknowledgement of the fact that you are now in a sequel. So yeah. rules are different. And, um, well, that's another thing this movie, if we have to criticize anything, actually, the first movie, uh-huh. uh, the legacy of the rules. Um, <laughs> because I know you and I have seen many, many, uh, yeah. not even just a slasher movie, but any kind of horror movie where there might be a heroine, you know. Uh, a final girl, if you will, um, mm-hmm. who does not follow the rules as executed or you know exhibited by Randy to the party of drunk people. I think the only exception uh, that I uh, kind of, or the, the only kind of like allowance I grant him is number one, he's a kind of a know-it-all and he likes to, you know, there's there's a bunch of people in the room who are like going, there's the blood, it's too red when there's no blood on the screen. And they, you know, <laughs> so he's he's obviously got, you know, some people who aren't the, the horror fan that yeah. he is. So I, I think mean, it's, like, he for Randy, to... that's like, that's like his time to be like the cool kid. Yeah. Um, because, you know, like, I, I mean, at least in the, in the way that he was written in the screenplay, like, I don't think that, you know, not that like Jamie Kennedy in either of those, like the movies that he did uh, where yeah. he was alive, um, uh, you know, came off as like someone who is like really suave or anything, like at least like compared yeah. to like someone like Billy. Um, he, you know, he seemed like not not necessarily like a nerd, but I mean, like someone who probably was this expert in a certain field of horror movies and that's kind of like where he became very popular. So it was almost like, like he's kind of like Gail Weathers in that way, where it's just like, yay, people are getting killed. I'm going to go do what I do best. And with Randy, <laughs> it's like, people are like, people are getting killed. Like, I'm going to go and do what I do best. So mm-hmm. they like each, you know, are similar in a way that they brought their expertise and people that's were true. drawn to that. So I think like for yes. in, in like R- Randy's mind, he was like, People are like listening to me now. Like I'm like the center of attention in this room, uh, and it was just like l- just eating it up. Um, but yeah. in terms of the rules, because I mean, like we already see that like they don't actually mean anything because Sydney herself loses yes. her virginity and still survives. Mm-hmm. So you know, and I and I see this a lot. Like as my my sign off in my videos is like I'll be right back. But um, you know, people, people would be like, no, you're never supposed to say I'll be right back because you, you won't be. But it's like literally like there's so many, even in, in Scream, there's like right after mm-hmm. we have the scene of the rules and Dewey comes out to the, the van and, and uh-huh. invites Gail on the walk and she goes out and she just turns to Kenny and she's like, I'll be right back. So it's like right off the right, right off the bat, she's ignoring the rules and Gail lives. So it's just showing that like like that's that's the whole idea of Scream. It's just like you're subverting yeah. the rules. And I don't and I think that like a lot of people don't get that. I don't want to say that yes. they, don't, they don't understand it, but I, I just think that it's like it's it's an irony of these movies that, that I think yeah. people might take a little too literally when when they're thinking about yes. the rules. Um, Absolutely. I have a friend, actually. I've done a few, like, uh, small gathering screenings uh, the past two years uh, with some friends. Uh, really, the past year. And um, we, we for a time, we were watching only kind of, like, low-budget horror slasher movies. Um, like, from the 60s and 70s. Titles that nobody's heard of. And I had a friend, Caroline, who just kept... <laughs> just kind of screaming at the screen just kind of like oh so wait so she's the virgin so she's the one who's gonna i mean treating it like it's an actual run i'm like you have to understand those aren't actual rules <laughs> kevin williamson <laughs> wrote a byline you know like for, <laughs> for like something a soapbox for a character to stand on and kind of like you know extol like these are the rules and everything like that of like because it's entertaining and everything but you can't take them that seriously like sometimes a girl can sleep with a guy and survive you know yeah. um maybe the guy won't but <laughs> you never know <laughs> the legacy they, of these characters yeah and I, and you know they get in more into in the sequels where they're just like you never know like i might be the one to you know get right. killed or, or something so it's there mm-hmm. you you can't follow the rules like the rules are that's the thing with this franchise like the rules are always shifting and evolving mm-hmm. um it's i did want to mention 
What's that? <laughs> it's the millennium. It's the millennium. <laughs> millennium. It's incidental. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I did want to mention, because we've talked about this before, you and I, but because I did just mention it when Dewey comes to um, invite Gail for the walk, but we see this twice in the movie, which I think is just oh. like the stupidest thing, but I love it for like how ridiculous it is. Um, because we see uh. it when Dewey comes to like bang on the door, because he does it in such like an aggressive and like surprising yeah. way but then there's also the scene when when billy arrives at the party and he's just like hiding behind the door and he like yeah. jumps out and he's like that and it's just like yeah. is that is not like a normal like human response like like i would expect if billy came to the party he would just kind of like saunter up to the doorstep and be like hey sydney i was hoping we could like talk or whatever but he's just like that <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> and I think also just like maybe Billy's such an ass that like he's probably thinking, oh, it's been a while since there's been a jump scare. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, well, I mean, he is own mind, making a real life horror mind. movie, so maybe that was yeah, his mindset. totally. But even so, like with 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 uh, Dewey just being like, hey, I want to go for a walk, and it's <laughs> we talked about this, and you know, we made a correlation. There's a, it's not a Treehouse of Horror episode of The Simpsons. Yeah. Um. Oh think, no, no, it's. It's a, a sideshow Bob. Uh, I th- it might. I don't know. I don't there, it's, it's the Cape one Fear, where no, but they're like one... making fun of Cape Fear, and they and the Simpsons yeah. family goes okay, into the, the witness Fear. protection program. So they're living right. on a boat that Bob. Right. Um, I think he like untethers, and they go down the river. He's like planning to kill Bart and the family right. or whatever. But like Bart's on edge because he you know like they're in the witness protection program because Sideshow Bob is coming after them. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope people know what the Simpsons is and, and watch it to understand this reference. But yeah. <laughs> um uh but Homer like comes barging into Bart's room and he's like yes. got a butcher knife or not a butcher knife, but like a kitchen knife. A carving a, knife. A carving yeah, knife a and a tray knife. of brownies. He's like, Hey Bart, you want a brownie? And it's and it's just like that ah! same kind of mentality of just like <laughs> Like dad, like I'm like I'm really scared. And he's like, oh, that, I'm sorry. How how foolish of me. And then he like leaves, yeah, right. comes back a second later with and he's with wearing a hockey mask and like brandishing yeah. a chainsaw, which is like actively live. And he's like, yes. wait, Bart, want to see my new hockey mask and chainsaw? Yeah, right. Yeah. And, like, ah! and that and just like, like oh. yeah, that reminds me of in Scream when those characters are like, hey, we need to do a jump scare just just because. Just for shits and gigs. Yeah, yeah, that that's yeah. a great uh, satire yeah. of, of what those moments are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, in addition to that, let me see. Is there anything else that like stood out to me in this particular screening? I feel like I might want to consult my notes. If you have anything to say, go for what, it. Okay, <laughs> how many times have you seen Scream? Dear God. It's probably triple digits. I don't know. Okay. But I love how <laughs> I you always I, have to like I, rewatch I, it. I mean, like I didn't re. I mean, I saw it uh, actually just before the new movie came out. I actually did a marathon of one, two, three, four, which uh, I've never done. So that was the last time I watched Scream, mm-hmm. and then the next day went and saw Five. But um, at this point, just because I always have it like on in the background, or like if I'm editing for you know a video, I might do. So it, I, it's in the hundreds for sure. Um, maybe yeah. I'll ask you, like, who's your favorite character in this movie? Not even if they're like multi, <sighs> uh, like franchise appearances, like just of, uh, in the body of this movie. Like, who do you? That's like who do you like to ask me? Who Anyone? are you? Who who's are your... you? Who? How, okay, <laughs> who's your favorite and who are you of of? These yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I never answered the who are you. I never told everybody yeah. a little bit more about myself. No, um, what's your favorite pizza topping, Eddie? I don't know. It depends on what mood I'm in. I will say, Pineapple. I think the most redeemed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that makes so much sense. Unsubscribe all these. <laughs> I'm leaning into pepperoni because it's basic, but it gets the job done. But I have to say, Scream, (laughs) um, I think actually, I don't do favorites really, really well. So I'm going to (laughs) subvert and just modify your question and answer a question I can't answer. I think the most redeemed character actually for me is Tatum. uh, Because I remember when I saw the movie the first time, all that stood out to me were kind of like Tatum's uh, trip-ups, like the mistakes she made, like the like the fact that like, okay, Sydney is, <laughs> Sydney's come over to spend the night 
this it was already kind of like a tentative situation it was like okay we're just doing this to like be safe and everything like that we're gonna watch tom cruise if you pause it just right you can see his penis and <laughs> and then she gets viciously attacked by a killer in her home <laughs> she thinks it's her boyfriend he's been incarcerated or he's at least not in i don't know about incarcerated but whatever the terminology is he's he's in police custody that's what it is and um, mm -hmm. she's left to her, you know, to, to, to go over to Tatum's now to try and feel safe and like a normal teenage girl, uh, which she's laying on the bed, like in the fetal position on her side, uh, Sydney is. And Tatum's sitting there like playing with, you know, a stuffed animal of some sort with her hair it's bobbing funny. around on top of her head, <laughs> talking about like, um, so do you think he really did it? <laughs> you know? and Sydney's just like, I don't know. I mean... You know, just talking in this kind of tone of voice. And Tatum's not reading the room at all. She's just like, he was destined to have a flaw. I knew he was too perfect. <laughs> and I'm just like, she almost got slaughtered! <laughs> <laughs> Granted, Ghostface is like one of the clumsiest like killers in the, the entire slasher, like, you know, a genre. Mm -hmm. So, subgenre. So, I mean, at least she's got... But Sydney doesn't know that. She This was her first encounter. Yeah. So, um... <laughs> So I remember thinking that, and also little things like uh, the the Richard Gear gerbil story and everything like that. I'm like, wow, this is really sensitive. Like talking to I feel like because I, I <laughs> like, even listening to like the commentary, it's funny that like Kevin Williamson even talks about those lines, like or like the the Richard yes. Gear thing, and I think the Tom Cruise thing, and and he said like he got like a lot of shit for putting those lines in the script and yeah. they're like, those are never going to work, but then they went in there anyway. So I almost feel like, is Tatum an extension of Kevin Williamson? Well, probably all of them are, but certainly, yeah. certainly yeah. she is. <laughs> but the thing is, in recent years, it, it hasn't been like, it hasn't taken that long either. But I remember for like maybe that first decade or so, Tatum was almost kind of branded among me and my contemporaries as one of the worst best friends like, really? in film history. Well, because she just seemed to not, I don't know, she just didn't, I, I, we kept waiting, I think, for Sydney. And I think we were overtly sympathizing with Sydney. As I've grown older, I've kind of seen where Tatum is reaching for her. Her, and there's some things you just can't understand if you're not inside the experience. Also, I realize like it's been a year since Sydney's mother has been killed. We have no idea what Sydney has been like this mm -hmm. past year. And I'm not saying she should get over it like you know, like Billy tells her. The way the cookie saying... crumbles, moms get murdered. But, uh... <laughs> Idiot. But um, I'm just saying one crumbly cookie. <laughs> I Actually, mean, I, don't, no, I forget okay, what the line uh, is in Scream. The 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 cookie. He's just like it's a bad stab. analogy. Yeah, yeah. No, well, no. When he's sitting, yeah, when he's sitting there, just kind of like, I mean, I just you just haven't been the same since searching her eyes for like some kind of, since your mother died. Your mother. I I just yeah. want my girlfriend <laughs> back because I'm a boyfriend. We'll get to Skeet Ulrich, but um, no, but just with um Tatum. Uh, I think I've seen her trying. I see her trying to make Sydney face the 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 potential truth about her mother, like the possibility that her mother might not have been a saint. And, you know, and maybe she was just a very lonely woman. Like, those are the lines that really resonate with me now. And also her protection of Sydney, yeah, like, I, like, in the face of Gail Because I was going to say, what I like see that. from Tatum, like, I don't, I mean... I never saw any of that stuff that that you used to see that apparently you yes. since changed over. Because I always saw like she's doesn't have a filter. Like she just says what she needs to say. Yeah. But she does go about it like when she's saying that stuff to Sydney. I mean, maybe not the the like I knew he like was destined to have a flaw, <laughs> but the on the porch when it's just like maybe your mother like really what like you know she's tiptoeing around it. She's not being insensitive no. by any means. No. Um, but she, you know, she doesn't have a filter. She's there to mm. stick up for Sydney. She's very protective of her. And those are qualities mm. that, you know, I think that if this was any other franchise or, uh, that Tatum was in and wasn't standing next to Sydney Prescott, like Tatum would yeah. be the final girl. It like mm. hands down because she is like, just like, like has so much depth as a character and we don't see that in any other friends I'm like and like any of the, the movies i would say uh, you know if i had to find someone who matched that just in terms of like a best friend you know possibly mm -hmm. sarah michelle geller in i know what you did last summer but i mean that's mm. maybe not the, the most fair comparison just because i think that sarah michelle geller is like up here, well, like Jennifer Love Hewitt, just in terms of like the character that we get is down here. Um, yeah. But 
you know, we can talk about that movie another time. I think yeah. that <laughs> I can't, Tatum I'm is, not going to argue. Tatum is not my point, favorite though. character yeah. of this movie. Okay. I, Who's maybe she's my. I, I know I did a ranking uh, of like in the Scream One characters. I think that she's probably. Yes. I, th- I think I put her in two, but like number one I said is Sydney. And I think that in terms of all the movies that we've seen, uh, like all five movies, I think that the first movie is Sydney's strongest outing. And not to say that she gets oh. weaker with every movie, because I don't like she gets stronger with every movie, absolutely. Yeah. But I think that the first movie is the is it's kind of like the the most inside look we get into her. It's like the most time that was allotted into kind of just seeing mm. who this character was. Where it's just like maybe the mindset more or just like how I look at it is, is like as we went into the sequels, I think that like we're so familiar with her strength that it's just like mm. we're we can safely just say like she'll be okay she's gonna she's gonna yeah. be good no matter what whereas like this movie i actually like you feel like oh my god like you know is she gonna get out of this i mean yeah obviously not on like <laughs> the the 700th time you've seen it but you know you there's a vulnerability to her mm. performance with nev campbell that you, I think that by the second movie starts, to, it's like completely shed. Um, but it's, it, sure. you see it a lot here. Uh, and by the third movie, she's just like, I'm done with your bullshit. Like, I've heard <laughs> it all before. Like, like, what yeah. are we doing? <laughs> yeah, this is, I, I would never criticize like where she is in her particular arc, you know, I mean, overreaching or like franchise arc movie to movie, because yeah. I think it's handled pretty well throughout every single one of yeah. them. But in this, in this movie, I think, um, yeah, it's probably the most varied and complex because she has the most growing to do in probably the most limited amount of time. Yeah. Um, did we find out? Because, because did you, you didn't is... tell me who you were, which. Oh, who I, oh, yeah, who which, I which, am. Who, who what do you character identify I with? am. Oh my God! You tell me who you, because I don't know. <laughs> I mean, okay. So here's the thing: like, I inwardly yeah. think that that I am Gail Weathers, um, and I had this uh, conversation. I, I I did a, a guest podcast with uh, Scream with Ryan C. Showers, and he asked me this question, oh and gosh. I had to say, like, you know, I think that I'm a Gail. Like, I just feel like inwardly. I just like yeah. I, I identify with that, but then like a lot of people are like, "Oh, you're such a Randy." So I just think like, well, maybe like perception is reality, and I'm actually Randy. But you know, like I was saying before, like they're not. I mean, they're very different people, but they're similar in, uh-huh. like in, in in a certain regard of just like their their you, their specialty. So you know, maybe you are Gail and Randy's would be love child. That's who could you, you are. imagine that <laughs> ship. That shit bent out. <laughs> Gay, what are we? Gaily. <laughs> Gaily, I love it. <laughs> well, it's better than Randy. She would want more space. She'd want yeah. more space in the combined name, yeah. and Randy would give it to her. It's, um. it's, 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 it's better than Rancid, uh, which is the the portmanteau yeah. of, of <laughs> Randy and Sydney. <laughs> I will never ship those two, but we can talk more about that when we talk about Scream 2. Sure. Um, in the first movie, who am I? Um, I mean, I'm, I don't I don't identify really with the kids anymore now that I'm older. <laughs> so Principal probably, Henry? <laughs> no, I don't want to be him because I would never... If I were a principal, I'd like to think I'd never drag, no matter what my students had done, mm-hmm. no matter how insensitive they were, no matter what boundaries they crossed. I'd like to think I didn't wouldn't like take scissors and drag them down or like grab like a young girl's chin and just like oh god (laughs) which was actually done on purpose to kind of like get you immediately suspecting him like oh he seems to have like you know a real well even but even like there's a there's a thing there with showing sheriff burke because he kind of like gave a look like what's that about yeah if you watch the outtakes for for the movie there's there's like a line just like so, Sydney, d- does your principal always touch you inappropriately like that? <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I don't know. I, I obviously, I mean, in my friend group, I do feel like Randy a lot of the time. Yeah. Just because no matter what the topic is, like, I either know everything about, or I mean, I, everything, you know, I'm exaggerating for emphasis. Yeah. But I, either, I tend to know uh, a way more, let's put it that way, than everybody else around me about a topic or way less 
And I know there are some t- some topics that Randy just can't converse on, but we never see him converse on those because they don't interest him. And he's in a horror movie, so he's going to talk about what he loves best. So yeah. I'm probably Randy in the first okay. movie anyway. Okay. Yeah. And also, I mean, yeah, in high school, I was always like getting crushes on people who, you know, it was unrequited, but, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. So probably Randy, okay. I guess. All right. <laughs> Anything else to add to Randy? Because I, I, we're just making our way through the characters here. So, um, I, uh, I mean, Jamie Kennedy again, another one who was cast who uh, kind of meets. He's one. I think he might be the only person in the movie who kind of meets Matthew Lillard's energy in that uh, video store scene, mm-hmm. where it's just like a very simple formula. I mean, his <laughs> face goes full cartoon, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's totally. But it, I never because. They're both in the same headspace, and they're both they're both good actors. They're yeah. both in the same space, sharing the space. It's not like either one of them is chewing the scenery. I think that's a term that gets abused a lot because chewing the scenery isn't j- like just being theatrical. It's overacting and doing it badly, like being yeah. a ham actor. And neither of them are that. I feel like they're entertaining as fuck. It's like a vaudeville routine. Yeah. <laughs> they feel like <laughs> real people to too. Like it, that's that's the thing. Like that everyone in this movie feels like a real person. Um, yeah. But I know that um, when Skeet Ulrich uh, came on board, he like specifically was like, I guess, just like what? Why are these two acting like such yes. jackasses? Like, do they not understand the movie? And then, like, yeah. I guess he like he says like he figured it out the first day. Like, they they took him aside. Like, no, ski. Like, this is like a comedy. It's, it's a I love comedy. that too. Yeah, <laughs> I love it when actors who are like young actors are like in uh, a, a movie that's like you know kind of supposed to be exhibited for their age bracket you know mm-hmm. and um they because the same thing i heard a similar story about shannon doherty when she actually went to a screening of heathers yeah and the first thing she said is the credits were rolling and the lights came up and everybody applauded she seemed really upset and people were just like shannon what's wrong you know are you upset with the way you came off the movie it was a really good movie what's wrong it's just like nobody told me it was a comedy and just <laughs> ran <laughs> and i'm like Awesome, because you were too invested. You took it so seriously. Like, you, it meant something to you. And yeah. she grew, you know, she, she, but because also I think when she read the script, th- you know, film, there's the script, there's the, the, the film you write, the film you shoot, and then the film you edit. And the one yeah. you edit is the one that ultimately gets delivered to the people. But we don't know what it's like to sit with no prior knowledge, you know, unless no one, somebody has never seen, never heard of Scream and they read the scary movie script by Kevin Williamson, the original one, they're not going to know what it's like, you know, for those yeah. actors. I actually talked to someone to uh, a, a few days ago because we, we were talking about Scream or they, they asked me about it and I'm just like, oh, you've never seen it? And they're like, <laughs> no, but I've seen scary movie. And no! Like, okay. <laughs> oh, my God. I've met many many young young people who likes and even liked scary movie and i'm like did it make any sense like yeah it was funny and i'm like and then you saw scream what was that like and they're like it's good and I'm like, although oh, okay, I, well. I do love the line where where he comes out he's like mm, ketchup same stuff my mom puts in her spaghetti yeah <laughs> baby there's a baby after that too i like scary movie yeah. too a lot i haven't like, seen it I in mean, so the, long the, <laughs> maybe maybe yeah, maybe it's I need been to a while. that one. Um that that the first one was strong. I remember I, I think that one might hold up. There might be a few jokes here and there that we can't make anymore, but you know. <laughs> I I would still I think I'd still enjoy a sitting. Okay. I don't know. Maybe we should discuss that at maybe, some point. Too. Maybe. Maybe. Well, tell us what you think. Okay. But um but okay, <laughs> get it, moving on to Skeet Skater. Yes. Skeeter. <laughs> I've never. And that you know what his real name that, is. And I don't I actually, that I have to look way. this up because like no, I, what is I, it? I can't remember. But it's not ski. Like it's like it's something really like basic. I, I should say. Um, Bob Jones. I, it could be, but no. Go go on. Okay. I'll look it up while you talk. Okay, while you're looking up Skeet, I'll discuss the Skeeter. Um, I will never get that out of my head now. But um, poor Skeet. He deserves more respect than that. Um, <laughs> I adore... I, his his actual performance is probably the one I adore watching the most subsequently. Like, Because uh, he really annoyed me that first time I watched the movie until I realized he was the killer. And then all of a sudden I stopped feeling like I was watching a young actor just kind of navigate his way through. And I felt like I was watching a, perf- you know, a performance. And um, 
it made me uh, but subsequently like watching it you get to see like uh all those little details that are worked in with him like it looked like he was shushing stew um about like slicing and dicing when they're all sitting in, in the infamous scene where they're all sitting around like the uh, the, the, fountain, the school grounds yeah. and um, outside the fountain and he's just like um, I thought it was a fountain but I, I for a second I was like have you seen this wait, movie am I just imagining actually? that <laughs> I have seen this movie but sometimes you misremember things and you create something and you're just kind of like hey those two were married right and you tell me Eddie just because they're a man and a woman and they're heterosexual doesn't mean they're married and I'm like sorry but um, <laughs> anyway um, so they went sitting at the fountain and he's sitting there saying like hey it's called tact fuck rag and um, you think he's just being protective because you know Sydney's actually, actually connected to someone who was gutted and mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, that's why she's trying to wrap her mind around, like, how do you gut someone? And so you think, oh, he's just being like a caring boyfriend or whatever. He's, and then you realize in subsequent yeah. viewings, he's worried that Stu's going to slip up because Stu is yeah. probably the least reliable cohort to have yeah. it when you're murdering That's another people. thing. Like, why, like <laughs> I mean, you know, clearly, I, I think that, like, Stu did a lot of the heavy lifting for him for sure. And it's like, if you find someone, yeah. like, as depraved as Stu, that's just like, okay, good. Because, I mean, like... It would probably be a real challenge to go around the high school and be like, hey, psst, hey you want to murder some people with me? <laughs> like that, you know, <laughs> that might not work in his favor. But um, yeah, but there, are, there is the scene that we were talking about earlier where he is like, I just want my girlfriend back because he does the like stupid. And it's like, yes, you yes, think yes. like on the first watch when you're saying that, it's just like he's saying that because it's like he's upset his girlfriend. But when you look at it again, it's just like, no, he's saying stupid because he like potentially like upset her to the point where his plan is not going to like go the way that he needed it to now. And even, even with uh, Matthew Lillard, like when he invites them to the party and he's like, Hey, you guys yeah. bring snacks. And he's just like, Hur! or whatever he does, like outside. The school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like a weird, it's like a winning kind of it's um... like a horse. Or a, or, a, or a pantomime. I always thought a pantomime of a chainsaw and a yes kind of Maybe like, you know, that was another Texas hybrid. Chainsaw Massacre reference that I missed. Maybe. <laughs> 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 if he would have done yang, 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 yang at the end, we would have, we would have nailed yeah. it. But, um, no, but getting back to the scene uh, that you mentioned, though, the, the one, uh, the Luke Wilson scene yeah. um, <laughs> um but when skeet does it see that's the thing is so many people remember even yeah. i like tend to remember like the luke wilson one but what i really really adore about that scene is you think also maybe because tatum was walking a tightrope and not really knowing like what's the right thing to say around sydney maybe everybody does and that's why he's fucking up so bad not understanding that uh her mother <laughs> you know your mother leaving town isn't the same as her mother dying but when you realize he's a serial killer <laughs> and um, and he's playing the part of the boyfriend and he's trying to do this scene to motivate her to sleep with him, the last thing he's going to understand is compassion because he's not equipped with that. So, Nat, of course my mom leaving town is the same as your mom dying, you know? Like, I don't understand mm -hmm. how your mom being in a box and my mom leaving town is, is at all different, you know? Um, and even and he even just tries to like I feel like reaching for the emergency cord uh, is just kind of like I just I, I want my girlfriend back you know like I, it's all about you I'm, I'm caring I feel like he's trying so hard to play like a Luke Perry in 990210 in his mind yeah. or something well it's it's and almost he's like he's Dexter miserably. in in this situation where it's just like such a big part of of Dexter sure. is like how do I appear as a normal person while also yeah. being a serial killer. Um, and if Dexter were really bad at it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she, I just love the reaction shot because, like, the like, there's Nev uh, as Sydney, just going like, like one at take after another is just like this baffled kind of, "Are you serious?" And then she just leaves, and so I, I feel like the stupid is really just like, "God damn it!" Like I should have. I could have scripted that better. I could have, yeah. you know, like, it's, yeah, it's right. like almost like an actor, like, you know, after a take, like criticizing his own performance. I I, I think it's absolutely well, He incredible. also does this thing, like, we see like a lot of these like leers that he makes throughout the movie, like not just the one oh, that, yeah. like with Stu, but um, uh, there's one towards the end when they're up in the bedroom that he actually like added in because he was, he didn't even tell Wes Craven about it, but he like looked at the yeah. door and then, like, went back yeah. to the conversation. He's like, did you see what I did there? Because I know that Stu's coming in there and he's going to, like, you know, fake murder me. 
they're like, yeah, like keep yeah. that in. And even the scene at the beginning, and I always like go back to this because I, because I don't think like anyone was talking about this until I brought it up, is the fact that Billy going to Sydney's house at the beginning of the movie there, like after the Casey Becker murder, is that they were kidnapping Neil because Neil's wearing the right. same clothes that he wears in that scene that he we mm-hmm. see in the end when they drag him out of the basement when he's tied up. Yeah. Um, and I look at that scene now and I see it because he like goes in there and he turns on the radio and he kind of yeah. like has this look that he's just like, you know, it's almost like I know that Stu's in the other room, like potentially yeah. uh, subduing Neil Prescott at this point. But it's like, you hear I'm trying yeah. to like turn on the music and, you know, be and do this thing where it's like I'm you know, propositioning my girlfriend or just, you know, you know, trying to get her to make out with me. And, you yeah. know, when you see that, it, like at, on the original viewing, you're just like, oh, yeah, he's, um, you know, just kind of doing it to because, you know, because he wants to hook up with her. And even I think, yeah. that, you know, even when people go back and watch that again, they, they're they not really cognizant of the fact that like this what there was a greater plan to that and, and having m- like more layers to their scheme of like this is yeah. where they're kidnapping the father. So it's like it's kind of really like I'd like to think I know that like they apparently didn't have these conversations with Wes Craven. I mean no one asks about that specific scene, but I think even in that mm. moment it's like he looks shifty and it's like you know that he's he's up to something. Just like turning on the radio too. Cuz that was something I noticed mm-hmm. recently cuz you hear the click of the the yeah. the radio turn on before the the don't Absolutely. fear the reaper uh, cover comes on. <laughs> also, before I forget, uh, Skeet Ulrich's uh, birth name is <laughs> Brian Ray Trout. Oh, Brian Trout. <laughs> Ray. Brian sounds... Ray Trout. I know, I know, but I'm just thinking like first name, last name, because you know, like in school, he was Brian Trout. Brian Trout. Like, oh, that's what? Did... Oh, wow, what a last name. I mean, his parents can't really be blamed for that, but I mean, they could have changed yeah. it. <laughs> that, could, that couldn't have been easy. Well, I understand yeah. why he went for Skeet. Was it? Yeah. Was do we know if Skeet was a nickname or I something no like idea. that? I mean, it, I, had, I, or... I'm not going to look it up now. You know, if anyone's listening okay. no, and you want to, you want to do a little yeah. bit more uh, research. You know, you you know where to to go. We're open to it. Yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I want to know. Uh, but um, uh, but uh, yeah, good name, Skeet Ulrich. Good name. Yeah. Um, also, uh, just a little incidental thing. Uh, people always kind of attribute his casting to like an echo of Johnny Depp in Night- Nightmare on Elm Street. And um, apparently, according to Wes, he didn't think he looked like Johnny Depp at all. He just thought he was the strongest actor. And it just seemed to be, I think maybe because also he was interacting with him as a person and maybe looking into Skeet Ulrich's eyes, his actual face is mm-hmm. not the same as looking into Johnny Depp's. He had, like Wes has experience doing being around both of them and around their energies. Mm-hmm. And they're both very, very different actors to him. He just thought he was casting the strongest actor. Yeah. And then on screen, it looked like, oh, yeah. okay, I, great. I mean, I think it's just one of those things that it just worked out to be very serendipitous uh, of the fact that, you know, like you have this character who is homaging Glenn, uh, Johnny Depp from from Nightmare on Elm Street in that way of of, uh, coming in through the the window, uh, as it were. But uh, (laughs) yeah, who else we got? Uh, Gail and Dewey. Okay. Oh, sitting in a tree. Sitting in a tree. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, who should we lead with? I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> six of one, half a dozen of the other. I mean, we could talk about them okay. separately or we can talk about them together. But I feel like it, it, this is really the only movie in the franchise where they do kind of exist like as their own entity. Because, I mean, like moving forward, mm-hmm. they are pretty much like tethered together. For, for, for everything mm-hmm. else like like their storyline is so like heavily predicated on the other that it's just like their their romance is is the big thing so it's just like and that's something that's not even really introduced until maybe the midpoint of this movie so like really like I think that even yeah. like introducing us to these characters at the beginning of the movie like we don't really get a like kind of a, a full idea of who they are we just know that Gail's the bitch She's like this this yeah. cutthroat journalist who who will do anything. But you know, she is throughout the most of the movie. And like Dewey is just kind of doofy. Um yeah. and, and they just happen to come together. And it was like 
yeah. like magic. So yeah, um, I know uh, the 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 turning point for Wes with Gail's character. He loved the line that Kevin Williamson wrote because he's like, "Now I know who she is." Was um, move your fat tub of lard ass now? <laughs> um, he was just kind of like, "Oh, okay," because he was he, he was kind of I guess he when he first read the script, he was just kind of like, "Okay, she seems a little opportunistic, a little yeah. shallow, a little self absorbed." But oh, okay, she's a full and full that's like her. Like that's really her first she line doesn't care. of the movie because before that, we just we see her in the background <laughs> or on TV, but that's like right. the first instance where she really like enters the movie, and it's like right off yeah, the bat, right. just like, "Wow, you are just a." Tr- atrocious <laughs> yeah but uh, one thing that i do really appreciate about her is in addition to being an unapologetic like stone cold bitch is mm-hmm. I, th- I don't think it's that, that that's her only quality and i think it's there in uh, courtney cox's performance it's when she's um having her second confrontation after she gets socked by uh sydney yeah. And um, they're at the school and she's just sitting there with the compact looking at her shiner <laughs> and <laughs> But she starts, ta- they start talking, they start really talking off the record. And um, Gail's uh, talking about like how, you know, Cotton's uh, story, Cotton Weary's story hasn't changed, not one word and everything. Mm-hmm. And she's just like, he admits to sleeping with your mother, yes. And then blah, blah, blah. And she breaks down all the details. And she sees the denial in Sydney's face, which Nev plays, plays wonderfully. And um, then she's just, but I love the, the the recognition in Gail's eyes, where she's just kind of like, um, he killed my mother and he raped her and he, you know, and all that stuff, and, and he's a terrible man, butchered my mother yeah. and blah, 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 blah. And then she's just kind of like, you're not so sure anymore, are you? Mm-hmm. And the opportunism isn't there so much as the reporter, you know, like a, a genuine seeker of truth and a person who can actually see through people's bullshit. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I really appreciate that at that early stage with that character, we also get like, but she's also really damn good at her job. It's a shame that she's that the, in the exact same scene, it's capped with her talking about like, if I'm right about this, my I could save a, a man's life. And there's Kenny going. Yeah, we could be a part of something. She's like, do you know what that could do for my book sales? But is that a shame? And she's back. Is that a shame, though? Because it's just like, I love that, like, she is that multifaceted. (laughs) Like, she is, like, so opportunist. Like, she's, first and foremost, and this is something we've seen, like, of Gail, like, every movie. But it's just like, I'm here for myself, but I'm also here. Like, there's also other things. Because, like, at the end of the movie, like, she didn't have to come back and save Sydney's life. Um, You know, she did that because she is... A good person yeah. like she, she's a I she agree. is a human uh yeah. after all is said and done it's just that like you know she's she's real she's just like she's she just got thrown she just wants to go for it um <laughs> i don't think anybody's supposed to be i don't think the motivation for that line being written was yeah. to get us more on board with her but if somebody is more power I to you that, but like, i always see that <laughs> I, well i mean i think at one point like brooke shields was attached to to play this role i don't know oh my god God. If that is actually like true or not, but it, it's that would so have been different. To, yeah, it's so hard to like th- like see this in any other way. Because I mean, like first of all, like it's Courtney Cox in 1996, so she was, you know, known as Monica at the time on Friends, yes, and this is yes. such a different role. And like you know, arguably, arguably, those are her two biggest roles, Gail and Monica, and it's like night and yeah. day. So it's just like for her to, yeah. you know, make that switch. And be yeah. this character. It's just like you don't like it's complete reversal. But at the same time, like right. there, there is more to her. Like she, she's such a complex character. And we start mm-hmm. to see like little bits of this in the first movie. Like it's we really see a lot of it in, in the sequel. Um, but I like that you know she isn't the main focal point of this movie. Obviously, Sydney no. is. So it's like I like Gail is my favorite character of the whole franchise. But I do, like I like that you know she is kind of peripheral for most of this movie. Uh, I, mm-hmm. I like I don't need to see anything else from her. But what I like, because yeah. um, I feel like with with her character, um, is just like the way that the story unfolds, which I really like because you have this backstory of mm-hmm. Maureen Prescott being murdered and Cotton Weary being. Uh, convicted of the crime and, and yada 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 and it's like you know in, in like a regular movie that might be a piece of exposition that just goes on for a minute or two and just takes up screen time and slows the movie down and it's just like exhausting because I mean like exposition is hard um, like because there's no it's yeah. you know in a script it's like 
having two characters come together, two or more, and just like discussing something that people already know about, or at least the two characters wouldn't know about. That's why like most of the time when you see a script or like watch a movie or something, it'll be someone explaining something to someone who doesn't know what's going on. Otherwise, you know, it's like, well, as you know, your mother was murdered yeah. last year and I'm the reporter who wrote a book <laughs> about it. Um, but, w but what Kevin and I'm sure like Wes, cause you know, I haven't read the script as much as I've seen the movie. Um, what right. they do that that's so great is that the backstory of Maureen Prescott is kind of just like peppered into the the story of like mm. the first act or so because it's not until like 40 minutes into the movie that we get the full story and it's done in such a way that it's like it it actually furthers the characters and it doesn't feel mm. at any point like we're stopping the movie to explain what happened so it's like it's almost like a mystery in itself for the for the first 40 minutes is like what did happen to sydney and her mother because all we get mm. is like the line where where tatum's like oh they, they said it's the worst crime we've seen in in years like even worse than oh, right. and then like well it's bad <laughs> that's another example of tatum like walking the the tightrope but then even in, yes. the, in the principal's office when they're just like oh we've got sydney she was you know what's her face's daughter um, mm. but then we get Sydney when she goes home and she turns on the news and it's just like, just one year ago, uh, wife and mother, blah, 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 <laughs> was murdered. And it's like, we're slowly getting these pieces put together, but it's like, yeah. it's done in like the most organic way possible. That's just like it, the, the story feels real. It's, it's not like we're, we're just like, okay, well we need to fill you in on everything because you need to get up to speed of, of what's going on here. And that's something mm -hmm. that I miss in, in. I mean, like any horror movie, I feel like I feel like if you can write your movie that way, um, mm. then then you you already have a more successful movie. I agree. Yeah. Um, I, I have absolutely nothing to add on top of that. I think you <laughs> I think you clinched it perfectly. Okay, well, okay, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, in addition to that, uh, Dewey. Um, if we're done with Gail, um, <laughs> you're done with Gail. We're done with Gail. Um, Dewey, uh, one thing that I appreciate, uh, is the fact that like, um, Dewey was used, you know, the, the scary movie, the, 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 the Wayans scary movie mm -hmm. word to describe him as doofy and he is doofy. What, one thing that I really appreciate to this day though, even though I'm not scared of it anymore, <laughs> the first time I watched it, I remember, um, I didn't suspect him as one of the red herrings once until um, that last hour of the movie when we're at the house. And it is the last hour, the party at the house. It feels so oh, much that shorter. that scene is like, it, it but goes, it goes on for days. It, like they even said oh like God. that was a nightmare because it, it took forever to... to well, do. yeah, that's it's the bulk of the movie yeah. and it doesn't feel like it at all. But um, anyway, um, but when uh, after his, um, you know, you want to see my new chainsaw and hockey mask moment <laughs> um, with Gail... And he asks her uh, to go walking, and they they're gonna start like you know taking another a turn off and off the path and everything. And he shines the flashlight on him, and he's just kind of like, "You're not scared, are you?" And when he did that the first time I saw the movie, I was like, "He's the killer! Holy <laughs> shit! He's just been like playing idiot like this entire time, almost like playing possum in plain sight, and now he's gonna kill you." And I don't want it to happen. But because I kind of don't, still don't like you, Gail, because they hadn't really, she'd only manipulated him up until that point. They hadn't really started the romantic, yeah. you know, the sincere sincerity of their romance yet. Um, I only felt like, you know, she was making a buffoon out of him trying to get the, the information. I was, you know, I'm 25. I was 24 for a whole year. Um, but um, I, I was terrified for her. And even, I, I was still kind of like, is the movie just trying to like, still be humorous when he asks her like you know what that constellation is and she's like no what is it he's like oh i don't know that's why i asked you <laughs> i was kind of like oh he's still doing it ew this is so gross i wonder but if that I was think, ad uh, lib i'd have to like look <laughs> it the feels like it yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's it's an old joke it's got whiskers on it but i think um <laughs> I, I appreciate it i think it's 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 cute because it's like banter you know yeah. like it, it, if, if they're going to, like, you know, establish some kind of, like, romantic chemistry, that's a perfect way to do it. But I don't think I stopped um, suspecting him probably until he 
got the knife in the back. I thought maybe he was still faking it when he discovered uh, Mr. Campbell's... Uh, Campbell. I always say Campbell. C- Cindy Campbell, Sidney Prescott. Mr. Prescott's. <laughs> yeah. I mix up the, the, the way in scary movie Anna Ferris and Nev Campbell. Anyway. Um, anyway. The car, he yeah. The car and, he, <laughs> and he acts all... You know, like whatever. I was like, oh my god, maybe he's faking it. And I, yeah, it was, it was a, yeah. it was, but finally when I he got think, stabbed, like that was, was like, such a great twist of the car being there as well. Because I mean, the, yeah, that's the thing with with these movies that I think like when you when you have to like understand the motive of the killers, there's always mm-hmm. someone that they're trying to frame, and yeah. that's like especially when you look at the movie in retrospect. Because I mean, there are so many scenes where like Stu at the video store is like, you know, I think it's the father, and yeah. yeah. <laughs> And Tight close like, up, it's like completely what they're doing. So it's just like even like when uh, Sheriff Burke is like, all those calls like they go to Neil Prescott's phone. That when you see the yeah. car, like that's like in my mind when I first saw the movie. Even though I had like idiots telling me uh, it was Billy and Stu, yeah, 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 I'm yeah, just yeah, thinking yeah. like, oh my god, that's, that, what's he doing there? So it <laughs> is like it is such a great moment of like misdirection. Um, that yeah. I, but I never would have ever suspected Dewey. Like he's just so lovable. Like you know, <clears throat> it's never but those, until he put that flashlight never, on his face. No, I was just kind of like, but it's, ne- it's never. And there was characters. a little, and there's a little, there's a little like it's it's not full music, but the score does something when he does it. It's like a pulse or something, and I'm just like, and because she's so like, she, I mean, even her, her reaction is kind of like he's like, you're not scared, are you? And she's like. No, you know, I'm like, I'm like, you should be, um, cause I, I'm, you know, suspect any, everybody. Yeah. And also, like I said, like I'm the movie's bitch as far as like, if it's going to bait me to like suspect somebody, I'm probably going to suspect them. Mm-hmm. And I think that's pretty much been true, uh, of every installment in this franchise, certainly. So, um, yeah, okay. I never know who the killer is. It is always a surprise. <laughs> we'll, we'll get, get we'll get more into that when, we, in the we, do, yeah. when we do the other sequels. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, anything else you think that we missed before we get to some cherry picking? I think that's pretty much it. Like I, um, I don't know. I, yeah, thumbs up, folks. If you haven't seen it, sorry, we spoiled uh... it for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm still, I'm still unsure. You know, I, I mean, it's top yeah, three yeah, favorite yeah. horror movies, but I, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah, that. but um, still, you don't want to commit. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, <laughs> let's get to the cherry picker. <laughs> So this is the portion of the podcast where we pick two characters, uh, one character each, uh, Eddie and I, of who we think deserve to die the most in the Mm. movie of which we're talking about. So Scream in this case, obviously. And what we're going to do is uh, let you vote on that uh, so then we can find out who deserve to die the most. And... Mm. I think, like, with Scream, it's really hard because, like, even the characters who, you know, like, on the surface, you would think deserve to die the most. I love every single person in this movie. Like, even, like, the more, like, peripheral characters, like, like the the Hembrys and and all that. Um, Like, everyone is just so good. I don't want anyone to die in this movie, even the killers. Like, let them live on forever. Um, But if I had to pick someone, because, you know, we have to. Yes. I'm going to go for the kid. I don't know his name. I think maybe like expelled teen number two. Um, <laughs> maybe he's number one. I'll have to look on the, the uh, IMDb cast list. But my reasons, not for anything that had to do with his expulsion, like, you know, dressing up in the ghost face costume and running around the school. Like, that's funny. You know, that, that's, that's, not gra- <laughs> that's not grounds for death. But what okay. is, is the fact that that same kid shows up at the party later and you already mentioned this earlier he's the one that's sitting next to randy and he's criticizing Mm. halloween for being having too much blood he's like the blood it's too red and it's just like no why do they do that first of of all it's like no it's not like are we watching the same movie there's not a drip of blood to be found (laughs) in halloween so so i'm i'm choosing him to be the most deserving to die because like a i mean criticizing you know one of the the best horror movies ever um mm-hmm. so there's that um 
Grounds for death. Grounds yes. for death right there. I don't even know if there's any, like, yes. there's not really a lot to say about him because that's that's his biggest thing. Um, um, well, he also chimes in when um, Stu makes the statement about, like, when do we see Jamie Lee's uh, tits? And he's just like, yes, 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 like like all frat boy and everything like that. Yeah, I definitely want to see tits. That's why I came. I got a beer. I'm a man. Yeah. And it's just so... Oh, God. Sure, like, dude, we'll throw that in. We we'll it. throw we, that in there too. We get it. Yeah. You're straight, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> so that pisses me off. I'm okay. Sorry, I'm so grounds for death. Your... You don't like. You, you're criticizing <laughs> Halloween, and you're straight. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just like being so like and you know what everybody you know, going, back to the, going back to the expulsion maybe just like the whiny way in which he said i don't know maybe it's not even him maybe it's the other guy but just like it's not fair oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> i don't remember who it is i don't like either yeah, of them whatever. At that point. Anyway, i think the other guy actually is they're both is, at the I don't party know yeah if... they're both at the party no they're, yeah they're both at the party but the other guy i actually i don't know i like his performance better like his reaction yeah. his, i just remember his face when principal Hembry is like Given them the business, and I, I just like his. I think he's a better actor. Okay. Well, thank you for you thank you for like helping me make my case. Uh, but I'll, I'll give the floor <laughs> no to you now. All right, my choice. Uh, I I fell into like the same kind of like quandary. Is that the word? Yeah, sure. that you yeah. did. Um, in terms of just like there are even even the characters I dislike are so entertaining, and I will never vote to kill someone who entertains me, no matter what they do. So I have to find someone who's worthy of death. And I think the person who annoyed me the most, which is usually probably going to be the factor from here on out. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know her name either, uh, but I call her Girl in Video Store. The one who interrupts uh, the conversation between Randy and Stu in the video store, who asks, what's the werewolf movie with E.T.'s mom in it? And my grounds for killing her is she doesn't know who D. Wallace is. You deserve to that's die. A sin. Yeah, and <laughs> that's a sin. Um, and she doesn't even know the title of the Howling. Like that is so. I mean, that's one of. If you don't know that, and also if you're, oh, I, I mean, okay. Oh, I have to calm down. Okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. Just <laughs> I have take, to put take a minute. My yeah. notes down and just take a breath and just say. She interrupted a conversation to ask a dumb question because she doesn't know who a legendary actress is and she doesn't know the name of the damn movie that she wants. And also maybe this is residual anger because I did used to work in a video store back in the days where, you know, you would go to a place to buy your VHS and DVDs eventually. Um, and I remember that some of the stupid questions I'd get asked, like, or even just people like, see, I'm, I'm, I'm putting all this on her, but I'm still want her to die because, <laughs> because of this people would come in and be like, I don't know what the movie is and I don't know who's in it, but I know the cover's red. <laughs> You're like red cover. Let's start with the A's. <laughs> you know, <laughs> maybe the genre. Do you know if it's drama, <laughs> comedy, <laughs> horror? Like, um, it's kind of funny. Okay, comedy. Let's try comedy. But you're know, like, oh dear God. Um. So yeah, she she that that's it. That <laughs> she yeah. deserves to die. Kill her. Yeah. Kill her. I don't. And also, she 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 just walked away. She did thank him, but then she just kind of like walked Fair. away. I love how like I'm I'm, not I love like Randy. <laughs> he's just like had so little time for. He's just like howling horror straight ahead. Like, <laughs> like go on, get out of here. <laughs> I don't even know if he had that much disdain in his voice. He did seem rather helpful, but I would have had that disdain. That's yeah. how much I dislike her. It's just emotional recall from yeah. my days in the video store. So there you go. Okay. Girl in video store. <laughs> or expelled teen number two. <laughs> or, yeah. Or maybe we'll call folks. him like the blood is too red guy. That, <laughs> People just, will just, definitely so know we, who Yeah, that just is. To, to, to highlight or emphasis the main reason why why he needs to die. So those are your picks. Right, right, right. So, I mean, <laughs> if you're if you're watching this on YouTube uh, or, you know, uh, listening to it, you can go to my YouTube or Instagram or Patreon uh, and vote for this. If you would like to become a patron, pat Patreon supporter, patron, same thing. You can find me on there. We release these podcasts the previous Friday. 
Um, so that's the one benefit of being a patron. Uh, or, and if you want to be able to have the RSS feed, I will link it in the descriptions below if you are watching this. And uh, what are we doing next week? We're, we're coming back next week and we're gonna have Valentine. 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 The, speaking of like movies that ripped off Scream from, from the yeah. <laughs> even though it is oh, 2001. God. But we oh, I we can't have wait. we have a lot to to talk about <laughs> Valentine and it, we certainly do. It'll be just it's... in time for the holiday. So anyway, uh, thank you so much for <laughs> listening, watching, and we will be right back. <laughs>